from the Rollist, your London-based tabletop RPG podcast. Today, I've got two guests, Gary, hello, and I've got James. Oh yeah. The reason I have you here today is actually to discuss a subject, to discuss an organization, the Roleplay Haven. So first, who are you two guys? We're both the uh, directors of the Roleplay Haven. We're the guys responsible, as well as two others, of maintaining and running this community interest company, which is a group of role-playing clubs scattered around London. Oh, so it's, it's several clubs? Yes. We have a Lewisham branch, and we have a Stratford branch, and hopefully soon, one in North London. Ooh, so and many more for the future. Addition, I like that. Maybe but world domination at a later date. Yeah, we're working towards that together with the Rollies podcast. We're going to build that. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we can work together on this. We've yeah, been for discussing sure. that. So for the sake of history and have a better idea of what uh, future historians going to tell about uh, the overlord uh, of this planet. <laughs> Gary, where are you from? I'm from Lewisham. Oh, so you've been there, you stayed there before you started well, I, your I, empire. I wasn't originally there. I was actually Bromley uh, sites and after many years of wandering, trying to discover my roots, I came back home down the road from Bromley, which was uh, Lewisham. There and back again. There's no place Hobbit's like town. home. Yeah. Great. And James, where are you from? Are you Lewisham as well? No, actually. Um, I'm a stranger to these parts. I'm originally from a place down called Red Hill in Surrey, and I moved up to the Midlands, uh, from to Redditch. So I'm actually down here uh, for work. So uh, I've got a bit more uh, stranger feel to basically being here in central London. So your work, your, what are you doing very briefly? I'm in the Royal Air Force. So I work Nice. Royal, oh, that's, uh, Force, that's classy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so mm. I've... Uh, you fly a higher and... Uh... No. <laughs> Top Gun. <laughs> Top Gun. So no, 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 no. I'm an electronic engineer and so I work on communications. Cool, cool. And Gary, what, what are you? I'm a logistics manager for a company called Modifius, which is a role-playing publishing company. No. Oh, interesting. So, uh, Roleplay Haven's one part of the business of geekness, and then on my other side is more geekness. Oh, did you two got into role-playing games? Well, I started when I was eight years old with Dungeons and Dragons. Well, it's getting younger classic. and younger. Every people are... Well, it's about was... eight and nine, you know, it's about <laughs> that sort of time. Um, but, you know, I was, a, I was a little kid then, and I was at boarding school, and... Uh, so I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, and then not long afterwards, uh, I brought Advanced Hero Quest, which is the old Games Workshop game, and I think from there it just absolutely exploded because the imagination, wow, I get to be a big barbarian character and, and charge around the board, killing goblins. And then it was onto Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which obviously opened up the imagination much more as well. Always a player. Yeah, I was always a player back then. I was always playing the games and all that. And Lucky then, man, that means he always had a game master around him. Yeah, it's getting rare now, G GMs. Um, but and I think I was up about 18, 19, and I became a GM. And uh, I've pretty much forgotten how to be a player now, and I'm just a GM all the really? time. Well, I love GMing. I love it very right much. So, And uh, I also do a few seminars on uh, GM workshop in teaching people how to become a GM as well. Yeah, we, we're discussing a bit more about that. But actually, I would, I would be very keen to, to attend one of those. I'm, I'm quite curious about no, that. It's good. I think you need to... Um, there's very, very little resources out there in the industry to give people the confidence to become a GM. And it's like, well, I'm reading a book, but I really want to sort of do it and get out there. And you can just have someone give you a little nudge and give you some few pointers and tips. It really, really makes a difference. And uh, James is also involved in this as well now. So it's something that we're all very, very passionate about is building a more of a, a community, bringing more GMs out there. So James, wake up there. What, what about you? Or did you get into tabletop RPGs? Again, I was uh, first introduced to it as uh, a wee little lad. Um, I did, one of a friend at school did uh, first edition D&D. Basically, someone basically said, at lunchtime, you want to basically do this? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. Sound like fun. And I didn't like it so much because um, I was turned away from it because it was being first edition and the way that the story was set was you come up to a T-junction. You can no, go left, you can I'm go I'm going to stop you there. I'm yeah. going to break the time rift, but uh, I think that there was something with a door involved. You yeah, told, there was a door yeah, involved. A door was there. involved and you didn't find it was realistic. What? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get that reference. <laughs> get that. Well, that's normal. That's because it's a reference. 
in the future. This is something that not happened yet. Gary and I day. are time travelers. Why? Right. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah. No. I think you're saying that. For example, there, there was like you come up towards a T junction and you can go left or right with no other extra fillers on there. So it's like purely fifty-fifty choice. I said, all right, I go left, and the GM goes, he goes, all right, make your dice roll there. And he goes, no, you go right. I don't want to go right. I go left. But that was the first day. And then uh, later on, when I was about sixteen, some of my other friends were doing tabletop role playing, and I got into it more, a lot more then. So, what games did you play? Or? It was mainly D and D at that stage. It was mainly D and D, and it wasn't until I sort of came towards to London five years ago now, when I started actually coming out and actually doing some more of the role playing. I, I had to you know more in, in my past, but I hadn't done any for like ten years. Some uh, some of the people were previous guests of the, the Rodis podcast, they're, they're, they're foreign, they're, they're not from uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, you know what, you try to interpret what you see and you, you build up this image. The theory was that a lot of British people would play role-playing games up to university or at university and then pretty much stop. Is it something you find is accurate or is it entirely wrong on, on my guest's part to, to think? I can I can definitely see where that comes into because you, you know life gets in the way and you sort of think about it and basically think that if you've actually got a, a group of your friends you want to actually all come together and do a bit of um, role playing and you move away that happens so that happened to me in, definitely until I came to London and I basically wanted to get back, wanted to get out of the house and I actually came to the role play haven and it was a very welcoming place that I actually wanted to come along with and and play. Uh, even though I didn't know anyone, so I think that's 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 one of the the things that can you can go try and draw out of people that's actually make them want to come and enjoy other people's company. Generally, it'll be like with your friends, and you can't it's very you know at the start. I think it'd be difficult to do with strangers. And I think personally that tabletop was that was my experience with uh, Guild des Rollis Francophones. The long role playing game is a great way to socialize with people. So you arrive in a place, you know, okay, are there any role players around him? And you'll spend some time around the table with them, going to meet people and going to make friends. And it's really part uh, of the thing. Uh, I can only assume people doing any sort of sport might have to some extent the same experience. But definitely for me, it was a way to meet people in London. To the 
role play heaven before we throw ourselves into the, the history uh, of it uh, is there anything you want to add uh, about the, the role play heaven well to be honest yes I mean but continuing on from what you just said um, it's part of it all really in the 80s there was always role playing clubs around and they all started to die out there was just a distinct lack of places to really do role playing games and I actually think part of the problem based upon what you just said was is there is not really anywhere to do role-playing games anymore you know people do them at their homes it's, it's not like like it used to be when i was younger we used to have a little church hall we used to do role-playing there or little community centers this is sort of tying in with our history uh -huh. bit, which is maybe was we were around too many people in a tight little small kitchen and uh we said well let's go out there let's build a club for people to go to. So they're not stuck in university. As soon as they finish university, they got nowhere to go because they obviously they went there and they were living there. So we said, let's get a place. Let's create a community. Let's bring people together and go, look, we've got a facility here. We're creating a haven for people to come to and do role-playing games. So you've just finished university. Great, here you go. There's a facility here for you to do role-playing games here. It's a bit technical, but actually I find it's important and interesting to maybe for, for people abroad and not living in London to, to understand. Again, it's something from a point of view which I'm, I'm more than happy to challenge, but the way it feels from someone coming from Belgium like me or most of the French uh, I've been talking to is that in France and Belgium, you've got these community places run by the government and these are the places where most of activities can take place and they are free to access with on very little condition and you've got this space. And here I found out, first of all, I never realized before living here that a, a pub actually was a public house. I mean, you don't know that with your, your broad. So I never realized a meeting public space were pubs, which is interesting and exciting on one hand. And on the other hand, from my point of view, was a bit weird because I meant that the public place was not accessible by younger people because they would sell alcohol. And the other thing you sort of uh, indirectly mentioned is that two days ago, someone asked me about role-playing games shops in London. It feels like the, the money pressure, the lack of space is extremely high in London. And it's, it's quite difficult for young organizations, non-profit organizations sometimes, unless they are part of something really identified as a charity. It's difficult for them to to get this space. Yeah. For the example of the Guild des Rois Francophones de Londres, it's an ongoing question of where can we meet and we need a place central because we got people also spread out around London, which also it's something very, talking a lot here, but uh, very, we never discussed that really, but it, London is a rather, it's, it's a low density city really spread out. And when you live there, you're quite far apart from your friends compared to to other European cities that would be familiar with. So it's and it's very difficult to find these centrally located places or even available places to play with. So we play, for instance, most often either in pubs uh, like the Goldsmiths and or the Tattershall Castle, which is a boat <laughs> on the Thames, or at the Royal Festival Hall in the lobby entirely and that's really that would be really weird for French people still mm. in France or Belgium to play in a entirely exposed space to people I've learned to like it as a making a stand about role playing games and explaining to people what are we doing but it's really weird so I mean although, let me put it, paint a mental picture then for all those people who who don't live in London um, travel can be very expensive uh, living, in, uh, living in London can be quite expensive to actually just hire a rent a place. What people tend to do is live close enough to their work that they can actually, the, the commute doesn't cost them as much. So that's because, so then you'll have people quite far spread out. Cost in, in money and time also. Yeah. And when you've got people meeting together, they tend to meet either like through London or you know, other part of the side. Just cutting in very quickly, my first role playing game in London was not with the Guild of Rollies, was with some people I found on the internet. And I was very surprised, and it was kind of a weird experience that I played in the basement of a Costa coffee. Mm. <laughs> and again, you, you're on the corner of a table, you're pushing people on the side, you, it's very difficult to get in the mood, etc. Yeah, but, so touching the space here is so it, it's, it's very interesting again, but that's the sort of pushing the, 
the the agenda of the role play heaven you, you really need places like that to to you want a space for yourself that you can get into and play a game and not get pushed out because it is a football night in the pub or that someone is hiring the space who's paying more than you because you don't have the money it's not to too that. noisy yeah <laughs> so to actually have somewhere where you can actually dedicate to yourself that you can actually come to on a weekly basis is what we actually felt is actually something that's actually very good um, to actually allow somewhere where people can actually come congregate and socialize So, and um, how did this get started? So, in your kitchen? Well, it was not my kitchen. It was a friend of mine. Started in um, his kitchen. Uh, it was just Wednesday gaming night. Wednesday already? Yeah, so Wednesday gaming night. And, um, you know, when you start getting to 10 people, you're in a small kitchen, uh, it starts getting a bit too much. And so, uh, we looked to go to a friend's house. And after a friend's house, we'd get more people coming along, more and more. So um, effectively, someone said, "Oh, we could do like a proper facility place." And actually, I mentioned that, and everyone said, "No, no, that's not going to work. That's not going to happen." <laughs> and anyone who knows me, if you say you can't do something, I love proving people wrong all the time. So we found an awesome place in the Lewis Club in uh, Lewisham, where we've been for for now, well, just past five years now, and it, it's just been absolutely amazing. I mean, that branch alone is now the biggest in London uh, role playing club. You know, we have seven active tables going off constantly there now. And now we have another branch in Stratford's. And that's on four tables from last week. We have four tables going. So again, to so, give a, a mental picture uh, to compare also with clubs in Belgium and France, you've got a single big room where you've got three, four tables going along yeah. next to each other. You, you, you don't have several rooms, right? It's just well, no. I mean... The Lewis Club has got like a little small little, we call it the dungeon, you know, so we have a little, we have a little room off, which, which is, well, it's kind of nice because it allows them to put some background music on, they can do their own sort of thing in there without interfering with other games. And then we have a sofa area for people to role playing games around the sofa, prefers the sofas. So you put the Call of Duty player in the dungeon and... Uh, yeah, 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 it yeah, happens. Away. The noise that, has actually <laughs> happened, that has actually happened before. We've actually had... Uh, One of the Call of Cthulhu players actually uh, going in there and actually putting on the mysterious music in the background, turning off the lights uh, and making and freaking out his players. He did that one time and then he said, can we not do that next time? One of the things we do do is we want quality gaming. We really encourage it. I mean, we want people to come along 
and uh, enjoy it. So we don't just generally let anyone just GM there. We want to make sure that people come along and have a quality gaming experience. So there's Cthulhu, maybe the lights out, get that atmosphere going, but obviously not completely out as well. <laughs> so effectively in the main sort of room itself, there is, you know, you've got all the tables scattered around and we try to keep them spread out so it's not too noisy for people. So again, it's that quality experience we want to give the gamers. And then Stratford is a similar sort of thing as well. You know, I mean, they're both private venues. So we, we try, not like yourself, we're in the, in, in the public domain mm -hmm. sort of area. We're a bit more private because we want to allow everyone to come along and I'm not going to be too nervous or worried about it. I personally, I don't mind doing it in the pub, but not everyone's like that. We want to make sure everyone's comfortable at the end of the day. That's yeah, what we're trying to do. We want people to be happy. I want you to come along and go, did you enjoy yourself? Yes, great job done. And then you got different games which got different needs also, I think. Well, we mentioned Call of Tulu already. That's it's got heavy needs in terms of mood and setting, which is maybe not as important for, I don't know, Judge Red games. I'm not saying that Judge Red games is not as good, but you don't need... Good as the GM makes it. The GM makes the game, in my opinion. You can have a bad system. There are a few out there. There's some really good systems. It always comes down to the GM. But uh, yeah, what I mean is some like noise issues are less of an impairment for a more action-based game than it is for a more intrigue and mystery and putting you in that setting where you, you, you feel scared or really into, into, into the game. And cue the spooky music. Could you play about pain anyway? <laughs> You're not just about contained clubs, so you're about reaching out. So are you in touch with Dragon on the Hill, for instance? Do, do you have things going on with them or other clubs uh, which are regular partners? We've definitely opened up to a lot of the other clubs to actually try and create a, a community basis to, to all of us. Being 
I mean, one thing that I can actually mention regarding the French community is London has a rich French community and actually it has a rich role play community here as well. Now, some French players have actually come to Roleplay Haven because we seem to be the top of the Google list. Beside me? Uh, beside you, yeah. Really? And actually said, um, we'd like to, can I play uh, can I Roleplay? And I said, I'm a French speaker, is that going to be a problem? And I actually turned around and given the option, I said, look, there's this French club, would you like to go to it? And some of the time, they said, yes, actually, um, I don't think my English is good enough for that, so yes, thank you ever so much, and I've given them the details. Other times, they just turned around and actually... I want to come along. It's funny, but I had that when, uh, and it was, well, it was our first chat between me and Roleplay Evan and, and you, James and Gary, was when you, you in a, in a very friendly manner, invited us to take part to, uh, the Lancon, the, what's, what's the full name of that, the science fiction? Well, it's, it's Worldcon, but it's, uh, got subnamed as Lancon. Yeah. London. So the, where they actually give away the Hugo Awards of science fiction, a big event of science fiction literature, and, and Roleplay Heaven reached out towards the Guild des Rois Francophones, the Long, by saying, would any of you be interested in running games over there? And uh, I went there and I had the time of my life. I was very lucky with with my players. But I found, I found it funny that although um, a lot of members and players of the Guild des Rois Francophones de Londres uh, have daily lives here in London, their, their English is, is quite good and they, they certainly uh, are respected professionals in their fields here. They were really concerned about mastering a game in uh, in English, or and I even have people uh, who just don't want to to play in English because they, they associate English with work <laughs> profession. <laughs> so yeah, and personally, it's something I'm excited about because it's good practice and going a bit further. Um, some games, I think they've got a special flavor when you run them in English. Like Star Trek, there's no appropriate way in French to say something like beat me up Scotty or <laughs> make it so. So there's definitely a, a lot of stuff I, I, I like to do uh, in English. And also it's very nice going into another one of the, the involvement of Roleplay Heaven. I had a blast last year at Dragon Meat. It's something I wanted to do for a while. I took part of a, in a game of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, playing a character with a very foreign accent, <laughs> speaking like that. Uh, so it's very good, a pre-generated character called Silence, it becomes Silence, and uh, I was played this tiefling rogue with so this... You're playing the stereotype. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not, not from the sword coast, coming from somewhere else where we, we enjoy uh, goblin legs with uh, garlic sauce, and uh, it was <laughs> really fun. So Dragon Meat, yeah, is that something that's something else a uh, role play even is in for? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm involved in it in two areas. One, I work for Modifius, which is the uh, one of the main uh, body of group that uh, runs Dragon Meat. But I mean, even before that, we were always involved in Dragon Meat and other cons because part of our mission stone is to, is to be part, help the community to be part of it. And like you said, with Lancon, we want to reach out. We don't want to just be the role play haven, we want to get other clubs involved and go, okay guys, do you want to get involved in this? It doesn't have to be exclusively us. It's a community thing here. And that's that's what we try to do with that with Lancon. We you know we bring you along, we want to get other people involved in it. It's the same Dragon Meat. We want to go along to Dragon Meat to sort of show, look guys, here's a club here, you guys can be part of it. We're also so we're giving some of our own staff out there, volunteers, to help run Dragon Meat at the same time. Because I mean, that's us trying to help the community. I'm jumping back and forth as usual, but actually let's go back to uh, the World Science Convention because it was, it was, I think it was something amazing. It was truly amazing. And, and well, I mean, long gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and you, you, your tent, because there was a, a tent with the role players and board games, you received a prize from the World Science Convention. Yeah, that I mean, was great. That, that, I mean, that was all started off as Esther, that she got us involved in that. And she was one of the people who was picked to run it. She came to us to help us out. And in part, it was just meant to be a, a rest area mm -hmm. where people could just have a sit down and a chat. And she arranged so much. She did such a great job. To be fair, I have to give her a lot of credit for yeah. it as well. Yeah. And she actually um, came through and actually uh, got it all together. And it 
worked so well that people were choosing to not go around the rest of the con and actually come and sit in our little area and play some of the board games, play some of our, our roleplay games. So the atmosphere was so good. What I heard is that it was the very first time you had a board game and tabletop role-playing game place in the, same area. In the convention. Well, sure, no, 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 first. not the first. There yeah. has been other places and they have done it. But it was. It's it's, hard, it hasn't hard. been as successful. There's been. It, Longcon wasn't a sci fi convention. It was the. Essentially, geek convention. Mm-hmm. It was a sci fi convention. But they had other elements to it as well, like Game of Thrones and. It's the but, Ugo one. Yeah, so. but um, they, did ha- they did have. George R. R. Martin was there. To, to be brutally yes. honest, from what you're saying with regards to the first time, I'd say it hasn't. It's not the first time. Okay. But it is the first time where I have seen it be done successfully that and not been pushed out as a side thought uh, previously the role play haven has been asked to do some other conventions where we had been in like a separate hotel area or been in a different part it's not as successful as it could be because people aren't aware of it but in this instance it was in an area where everyone w- would be coming to sit anyway and then if they wanted to they could get involved and it worked out very well. That it was actually very popular. There were very cool things. There was a, a giant pandemic board game. There was a giant ticket to ride board game. And again, I mastered there. And it was great. It, it was difficult, a bit noisy. Two hours game, so you, you need to think, keep things tight. But I mean, it's amazing to be there and have players coming in. They never really played a tabletop role playing game but they are wearing a Starfleet uniform and I was running Star Trek I was rerunning scenarios I created for, for my players and uh, my best memory as a game master is there I had a, uh, had a girl we played a scene where she said oh, I, I want to do this. she was a student Starfleet Academy I, I want to see the consular I said well you cannot see the consular because you can only have uh, interns who are training into that so okay, you uh, you arrive there, you sing, uh, there was a chair, we do, we put aside the rest of the group, say you, she sits with you, there's a short woman with long hair, uh, kind of curly, a, a young woman, we say, oh, hello, my name is Dina Troy, and, and, and the girl's eyes lighted up, and, and when we came back to the rest of the group, she turned to her friend and said, oh, I just met Dina Troy, <laughs> and the other one didn't know what she was talking about, but. It, it was so great. And again, people who never played role-playing games, it, it was quite... It was very, very successful. And I think it's ultimately because there was such a brilliant, fantastic team there. I mean, Esther was done a fantastic job in getting the right people involved. Uh, you know, we dominantly took care of a lot of the role-playing games sort of side of thing. Uh, a friend of mine who was also a co-worker, Rob Paris, he did a lot of the board game sort of side of things there. So he gave the giant pandemic and the ticket to ride sort of side I'm going by on the pandemic. It's so funny. I've got pictures that because the game was so big, whatever, like you, four tables. Yeah, you, you you had to look over the map to understand what was going on. Where someone on the other side of the table saying, "This thing is happening in France." You really felt like you know the in the control room <laughs> headquarters of a organization trying to solve what was going on. It was really epic. Stuff. I went to Essen not long ago, and I had a giant Catan board. When I want to say giant, you had to stand on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the it's dice so cool. was almost half the size of my body, the dice was that they were rolling. <laughs> that was pretty damn special, I thought, to be honest. So sorry you were you were saying about um, uh, Rob and uh... No, I'm just saying that you know it was it was a fantastic team and I think it was a great again is what we preach about so much. It's about bringing those key people together in the communities. When other clubs all start working together these sort of projects really come, become fantastic. You, you create this great experience for other people. It's difficult enough to basically get a role-playing club or a role-playing group together, let alone then turning that into a club. So we don't necessarily... We, we don't want to be against anyone. We want us all to be together. Like, if a person wants to be going to a different group or anything like that, it should be competition amongst ourselves. We should be all helping each other. And that, that's kind of like our ethos mm-hmm. down to the role-play haven. We want to create a, an area where people can actually come, enjoy themselves. No matter what your background is or what your interest is, to come along and feel, know that there's an environment which you can go along there and have a good time. 
I think uh, ultimately the Lewisham branch particularly is made up of, of about five clubs. They've all come together and it's not been one person ruling that club. I mean, James has came along halfway through the club. Of, oh, he's been there for, is it three or four years? Three years. And, you know, he became, you know, he's, he, he was a chairman of that. So it's very much a community thing there where the members get to elect who they want to run for that particular branch. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's made up of a collection of clubs. It's, it's creating them all together. I mean, I, I to carry on with that experience yeah. for everyone. I came to the club here yeah, three years ago. Uh, perhaps three and a half now. Uh, grief. And just there, and I was actually really taken aback by how welcoming it was and how I actually enjoyed the people's company there. So it came up to a bit and I wanted to give back, so I volunteered to help out on the committee. Did that for a couple of years and then actually was like, okay, now I'm going to be in, in charge of the club. And again, voted in by the by the members uh, to the moment where we actually are now. You thought about yourself, you're, you're beaming. True masters of Channel Flat Time. Militant pilgrims wave unseen flags in the turning of coded pages, suggesting new archetypes to galvanize forward-thinking human creation, popularizing images of an alien overmind to contrive a bridge to lead over the abyss beyond this cage of space and time. So the the club you I think you were talking about the the, the last few years from from what I understand you 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 became something official in some fashion over the last yeah. few years. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's something that one of the things we've kind of um, done to to help our mission statement as it is. So we, we, we said that we are a non-profit organization. So what's the the why you did that and the the the, the, the what it is exactly? Well, especially for for rain where you know cha charities, non-profit, these right, sort of okay. things. Right. Um, okay. It's uh, a long story short. Is essentially it's something that was set up a, a while ago by the government to help communities who've got interest in something get, make themselves a bit more official, and so they can help themselves out, and they're not basically getting charged too much for things. It's something called a community interest company. You're you're helping out your community, so the government wants to help and give that back to you. Uh, so we get some help out, for example, from the government in certain cost reductions of things, and also get a little leeway. But also that means that we are not a proper company that we're not as tied down to some of the the proper laws that. But then we get a little bit more leeway. So we're the best of both worlds. We're kind of half company, half charity. Okay. And come in between, the, between that. And that actually gives us an official, in the eyes of the business world, an official standing where we can actually approach people as an official entity, as opposed to a group of people who come together and do a bit of role play. Mm -hmm. okay. Because you don't have any official name or official standing. There's only so much sway you can have. So one of the reasons why we did this is so we could actually do some of the expand out and actually approach certain government organized uh, entities that can actually help us out. For example, you've got community centers. Now, if you've got helping out the community, you will actually get some them for free or even a much reduced price. It's very difficult to argue that role playing interests the community. So we couldn't always get necessarily the reduction in price there. So 
by doing that, we've actually officially put ourselves as a company now that can help us out in getting reduction in prices and also good standing. And it helps us out by allowing us to give us a standard that we can approach other businesses and companies to aid our interests in actually bringing role playing to the community. I think the best way of looking at it, role play is the oldest form of art. <laughs> it's a story, you're telling a story. And um, yeah, and we're going to be hopefully continuing telling that story for many years to come at the moment. I think we also, the good thing about it, and what really makes me smile and happy most of all, is the fact that when we do give things back to the uh, community, so we, part of what we do is we invest into the Lewisham Hospital, we give money to that, uh, we're involved in other charities at Cancer Research as well. So it, it makes it nice, it means when you're when people come into the club and they're joining into a role playing game, some of that money for that role playing game is going towards charity as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice feeling. I'm playing a role-playing game tonight and it's going to charity some of my money to that. So that's a nice uplifting today. I think not to paint ourselves in uh, the greatest picture, but I think it's quite close to the heart of a lot of gamers. You see a lot of initiatives uh, across the world, uh, like Child's Play, where uh, it's, yeah, it's about uh, making taking advantage of a hobby and sort of... Uh, uh, organization to, to good. yeah and uh, mm. and be part of the community and support uh, causes around the world. We I think we are rather positive people, <laughs> so we can uh, work to have a, a positive influence. What are the day to day well sort of regular activities the the role play heaven is involved with? There, there's stuff going on both in Stratford and Lewisham every Wednesday, right? No. <laughs> no, uh, Lewisham's every Wednesday. Okay. Stratford's every Tuesday. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a prime example. There's there's a role-playing active club in Stratford already, so we picked to do it on a Tuesday to sort of help them out. and So that's why we're on a Tuesday there, and Lewisham was on a Wednesday. We didn't want to be um, cutting into their night at all. Yeah, yeah. The other yeah, way it's just rude <laughs> for starters. Um, and then, I don't know, who knows, maybe uh, North London about another day. It depends on what the uh, the new potential members want of that area. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, when you said about Dragon League, what we'd be up to at Dragon League, one of the things we'd be doing is, is doing surveys as well, finding out what the the, the community wants, uh, which just allows us to plot where we're going to go next to, to help the community. So, but yeah, we run on two days of the week at the moment, and then of course we run various special events throughout the year as well. And you got you got four to five games running. Uh... Seven for Lewisham every Wednesday. Four currently on the uh, Stratford, but obviously that can fluctuate if the GM's not always there. I mean, we we do a whole, whole every uh, now and again um, additional um, events. One of the most recent ones is uh, celebrating our fifth year. Uh, anniversary, our fifth birthday party, which I missed. And yeah, I'm very sad we about had it. cake and everything. Uh, it was pretty good. <laughs> no, it was a, a day um, full of role playing and activities. Uh, we invited some of the, the the original starters of the group back, and that was quite uh, emotional on their part. That they actually really appreciated. But they, they would... came back from twenty years ago back to actually see what the club is this still This is around. when it was just called Wednesday Night Role Playing Game at, in this kitchen that we were talking about earlier. And I saw it's cut in on the yeah, agenda. This is where I'm kind of really, really happy and pleased with because these guys have never really seen the transformation. They literally, one minute in a kitchen and the next minute, bang, fifth anniversary party. You know, they're absolutely blown away. Like, wow, look at where this has all gone. And I think everyone was absolutely glowing. It was, it was a real great vibe and buzz and... I was so, so proud to see it all come together on that. Yeah, and really sad I was not there. I was actually in Barcelona where I recorded episode three. And uh, an apologies from the Guild of Rollies Francophone Delon not to have been there. Sadly, it was Sorry. some weird weekend when a lot of stuff happened. It's unfortunate. Uh, but uh, what's, uh, what's, I'll be well, there for the Christmas quiz again like last year. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll pencil you in for the 10 year anniversary. Uh, no, actually, no, I'll write it in pen now so that, you know, 10 years from now. You'd be coming back. Okay. Ten years. Let's uh, oh, engrave it. Yeah, engrave it. Ten years anniversary. We got some experience with that because we celebrated our own last year. So. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. What was the invitation? 
Uh, yeah, you know, we were <laughs> quite enclosed back then, so, but we're trying to open up. That's why we got now the monthly drinks and uh, etc. And uh, we're going to have board games uh, every monthly, a month. It's not that we've been close to other people so far, but we haven't made, uh, we did not invest it, uh, ourselves enough to reach out. But uh, yeah, we definitely want to do to more more stuff, so... But for sure, the quiz one is something we'll see you at. So. That was really cool last year. I mean, your hosts they were really, really nice. And to be honest, since uh, last year, uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the edge of suggesting you to have a few uh, French-oriented uh, questions. Uh. Well, yeah, maybe. But it's, it's feedback, because I mean, one thing we've always tried doing with that is, is getting the... Um, so some of the questions will always be themed around some of the games we played. So it gives an option for everybody to ask. Because not everyone's fantastic at quiz design, so mm. I'm rubbish at them. So it gives everyone the opportunity. So they do do a lot of research. They're already researching doing it now. So, you know, I'll say to them, look, uh, some of our French friends will be coming down. So they might do some little research and at least a few questions in there. Uh, I will uh, talk to you about uh, an idea I would have. Uh, but we, we need you guys having your own team. And what we want to do is get clubs to have that team because there's a trophy and your name will be oh, on that trophy. It really is because what I like it, I think, no, I think if we would come there, several people, I think it's funnier to spread out so we can... Uh... It is, it is, but we, again, it's, it's it's doing those steps and yes, we can spread everyone out, but you're less likely some people want to get involved, but if you get a whole club, that's the first yeah. steps of building that foundation between new people and making new friends. About the stuff which are already confirmed, let me know if I'm missing anything. In this order, Dragon Meat, December 5th. Yes. At Earl's Court, at the Ibis Hotel. Google and Dragon Meat. Use Google, that's me. My Google, you can find my podcast, you can find... Dragonmeat.co.uk. Uh, Dragon you Google. can use any other um, you know, search tool. <laughs> Alta Vista, if you but want. But if you do, pop by and say hello. Yes. Yes. We will be wearing t-shirts so you can recognise us. And I will leave a pile of Guild of Rolling Spock of Run. And we'll the quietly put them in a bin. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, no. We, 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 we have uh, advertised uh, other people's um, stuff there before. So Dragon Meat, December 5th, uh, Saturday. Go there. You can play games, board games, whatever. You've got every Wednesday Roleplay Heaven in Lewisham, every Tuesday in Stratford. The Christmas Quiz, about which I heard some people are not happy with the name. I think it's fine. I just uh, think <laughs> calling it just the Christmas Quiz is a bit boring. It started out like that. It started out <laughs> because basically it was the week that everybody started to go on at home for oh, Christmas. Christmas. So, so, so we decided to throw a quiz there. and then yeah, it's just Two broke. tables and yeah. it's just massive now. Yeah, so now yeah, people actually staying here for extra time just go for the quiz. I was like, oh, okay. Hundred pounds worth of prizes as well. So yeah. this year, the still to be renamed Christmas Creed. It's on Wednesday, December sixteenth. Yes. There's a game master workshop coming on Monday, January twenty fifth. That's in Lewisham. Yes, it's a GM workshop, and that's where all of the GMs come together and effectively share their experience on what they think makes a good GM, uh, which is a, a great initiative that we've done to boost confidence up in GMs. It's not the first, right? It's not the first, and it won't be the last. And it's really it's just, again, it's about bringing, you know, the ones that I would do, i uh, just do them more as almost like a seminar with the RV Haven. It's more a community. It's more of a workshop sort of thing. It's about sharing all... I mean, you can learn so much from all GMs. You can meet even the newest GM and come up yeah. with great ideas. They've come up with they've come up with awesome ideas and it helps you adapt it. But it's most of all it's given the confidence of newbies, GMs who don't know, you know, how do you run a game? How do you form that plot line? What do you do when that awkward player closes the door? No, what do you do when the GM closes the door and you can't get through the door? Yeah, because it's, it's, you're it, pulling the handle. That's that time travel reference again. Yeah, 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 so yeah, we right. need to we are like time lords. We, we are, we are, and yeah. Ah uh, yeah. James, anyway. <laughs> Where was I? Um, Christmas quiz. Mm-hmm. We're moving on to then you've got the GM workshop. So what's the, the, tell the, like, what's the Christmas quiz is like? I've been there. It's, it's awesome. Come. Um, um, okay. Um, yeah, come along. Right. It's uh, for anyone to come along. Um, it's free for anyone to attend. Uh, we run that off at, 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 at Freebie. There's prizes there? There's prizes to be won. If it's, it's not like a standard quiz. 
I suggest we wrap up with my usual homage to uh, the Weekly Planet podcast with what are we reading? What are we going to read? James, what are you reading or looking at? I am actually reading up at the moment, reading up a lot on the Fantasy Flight Star Wars <coughs> games. Oh, there um, might be an episode about that in the yeah, future. Yeah, let's the future. Well, there's, there's quite a few books, but the reason why I'm doing it is because myself, along with a friend, in the new year, I think around March time, we are going to be doing a Star Wars LARP. Because nice. um, we are actually looking for something to do that could actually fill a gap, and we worked out quite easily the tabletop roleplay can actually be translated into LARP exceptionally easily. So we've uh, been hashing that out for the last couple of weeks and now we're just basically putting it all together. Um, so by the time it's in April, we should have our first game in central London. So that's what I'm going to be working through. Cool, cool. I, I, you need to keep me posted about that. Definitely. Gary, anything? Mine's a bit work-related because I'm reading the uh, beta rules for Conan, the new Conan game that we're working on at Modiphius which is equally exciting, and I'm a huge Conan fan, so uh, yeah, I can't say too much about it, apart from what I'm reading it at the moment, and it looks awesome. And then what I will be coming to, I don't think I'll be reading much more for a while, so I'll probably be catching up on TV shows like The Walking Dead soon, because I'm a big zombie fan as well. But well, actually, I'm I'm also reading uh, some Conan. What a coincidence! Uh, <laughs> I imagine that. Reading the Complete Chronicles, so Conan wrote your work. and actually it's quite nice because it's a very large book, a big book like uh, Lord of the Rings style, which I I won't take along in the bus. But actually, it's a uh, it's a lot of short stories, so you you can read uh, whatever section is whatever order. It's it's I really nice. It. Is it Howard's work? Yeah, the, 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 yeah. your work. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, because I heard also about the game, and I I, I really talked about um, another sword and sorcery game called La Lune et Douze Lotus, the Moon and the Twelve Lotuses. Very tiny in a shibby collection by John Grumpf. And uh, what I'm gonna read to move into that, I'm gonna read the fourth volume of Saga, the comics sort of space opera by Brian K. Vaughan and uh, with uh, the illustration by uh, Fiona Staple. So, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you. People, listeners of the Royce Podcast might hear a bit more about you uh, quite soon. And Mark, also, our favorite British pie. <laughs> See you soon, and uh, in the meantime... And goodbye from me. Merci, and goodbye. And good games. Today's episode included London Town by The Shrubs, Home by Ramsden, Sit in One Place by The Carney, Masters of Science Fiction by Lazy Magnet, and of course, Solta of Franco by Bondedoro. All songs available on the freemusicarchive.org. One last thing, I've been in touch recently with a France-based podcast, and we have a project for maybe a crossover episode. I, I won't specify which podcast because nothing is confirmed yet. But we would be already very interested to receive your questions. If you have any question you are wondering about regarding the players on the other side of the channel or the other side of the pond or whatever the opposite of Down Under is, please send them to me through any means detail in the description of this episode or via email at rollistpod at gmail.com. That's rollist with an S. I hope you liked this episode 4 and that you will be back for episode 5 which will be a special James Bond. Nós é tipo bem Jesus, todo mundo a gente ama Ainda mais se for gatinha, rola até levar pra cama A gente topa tudo, sapatão e bigodudo Na hora do piriri, cai em mim ou travesti Vai, Batuque! Rolê! 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 Solta o frango e vem com a gente Rolê! 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 Solta o frango e vem com a gente